Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Tina Roman. Um, I am helping to host this event. We are doing a homeschooling in New York City with Brooklyn Queens Leah. Uh, today we have, well, my name is Tina, but today we have us with us the chapter leader, Jackie Gittins, and one of the steering committee members, Shalon Facey. So Jackie, I am gonna throw it over to you and we will see how it goes. <laughs> uh, welcome everybody that came today. Um, we're excited that you're here and um, really excited that you're homeschooling this year. Um, whether you have been homeschooling for a little while or you're just getting started out, um, we should have a lot of information that can be helpful either way. Um, again, my name is Jacqueline Gittens or Jackie Gittens, I go by. I've been um, homeschooling for about 16 years. Um, my three awesome kids graduated, my two oldest, and we're still homeschooling our last who's in going into eighth grade. Um, and we've been chapter leading for about four years. I think it's been four years now. Um, and in leadership for about six years. So we've been around the block a little bit, um, have, have learned some things, have forgotten some things, um, but have grown every year. So um, I'm gonna let Shalon introduce herself and then probably toss it back up to Tina to get started with our first bullet point with paperwork. <laughs> Hello, I'm Shalon Facey. I am homeschooling mom of two children, one that's graduated and entering their sophomore year of college and one that it will be going into 10th grade. Um, we've been homeschooling for a long time, um, <laughs> forever. Neither one of my children have ever attended traditional school. So we've been doing this for a while. Um, we live in Brooklyn. And um, yeah, I'm excited to answer questions and share what I know. Awesome, so uh, I get to kick this off. And um, so my name is Tina. Let me just make sure you guys throw it in the chat. Let me know you can see me just to be on the safe side because <laughs> it's not coming back to me on speaker view. But my name is Tina. I have been homeschooling going on six years. Um, it has been in enjoyable ride. We started in the middle of second grade and now we are in eighth grade. So that has been so much fun. And uh, just to move this along, because um, I do want to re refer you back to, we're going to keep the paperwork section short because we did do an uh, intense workshop last year and that is on our website. You will find that either on Facebook at BQLEA chapter or you will find it on our website, brooklynqueenslea.wordpress.com. Uh, this meeting is being recorded, so welcome to all of you. And um, I just wanna go into the paperwork section real quick and then they all get to take it away. So the paperwork is kind of my baby. I've always had fun with the paperwork. Um, I, being in New York City, we can keep it very simple with our paperwork. It doesn't have to be in depth. The, at the last count before COVID and before religious exemptions were taken away, we had 5,000 plus homeschool families in New York City alone. When they took religious exemptions away, there was a jump there. And then last year with COVID and everyone needing to stay home, we saw another jump. So we have no idea how many homeschoolers there are in New York City. What I can tell you is that there are max of three to four people in the central homeschooling office that takes care of all the paperwork. Now, when I say 5,000 plus families, understand that many of those families have multiple children. So it's not 5,000 pieces of paperwork they're receiving, it's a lot more than that. Um, so as we get started with the paperwork, the first thing you wanna start with when you're doing paperwork is submitting a letter of intent. That goes to the Central Homeschooling Office in Manhattan. And it basically says, I am choosing to homeschool my child for the X school year. So in this case, that would be the 2021, 2022 school year. That's basically all you have to do. It is then up to the district and Manhattan covers all five boroughs. So all five boroughs report to one school district, which is interesting, but that's okay. Uh, after the letter of intent, they are supposed to respond to you within 10 days that they have received your letter of intent, that they are moving your child from the school system registry to the homeschool registry. With that being said, <laughs> it's most of it is done electronically now. So it is 
a much faster process. You may get an answer to your letter of intent or you may not. There is usually an auto response that says we received your paperwork. Let me just double check this. Okay, um, there is a, I'm gonna change this back, hold on. There is a uh, auto response, like I was saying, and all of the paperwork, the homeschool packet that you're supposed to receive along with the a copy of the regulations are all on the New York City homeschooling website now. So they're not sending that packet to you anymore. If you are an ongoing homeschooler, you might have received the letter this year with a barcode. It was a little confusing because um, it what it linked to was for you to submit your letter of intent for this year. Because it says survey, it threw a lot of people off. But that if you if you submitted the information that was on that barcode link, um, then your letter of intent is submitted. Once that's done, like I said, the district has 10 days to respond. You probably get an email. It's 10 business days. After those 10 business days, you have four weeks or August 15th, whichever is later, to submit your IHIP, which, which is your individual home instruction plan. That is the paperwork where you are laying out for the year what you plan to cover with your child during that school year. Um, we, like I said, we have a more in-depth workshop, so you want to definitely go check the website for those, for that information, but, um, that can be as simple as one page. I have some, some that are three, four, five pages long. It doesn't need to be that long. New York City does not have time to read all that paperwork. You can keep it as simple as possible. Obviously keep your own detailed records, but for what you're sending into the district, you can keep it very simple down to one page. It's as simple as listing what each subject is and what resource, curriculum, books, whatever it is that you plan to be using for that. On the IHIP also, you are going to be listing the grade that your child is in. Now that can be either their age appropriate grade where they actually are or a grade range or their actual learning level. So if you have a child that is maybe supposed to be in sixth grade, but learning level they're at fourth or third, you wanna list their actual learning level for that. Um, I'm going through this very quickly. So if you have questions, drop them in the chat box. I do see some questions coming in. We'll make time to come back to those. So don't worry about that. After the IHIP, there are quarterly reports that need to be submitted. So you get to choose your dates for your quarterly reports. If you school year round, as long as they are more or less even, you can pick whatever dates you want. The school year runs from July 1st through June 30. Paperwork cannot be, sub well, it can be submitted, but you can't list a date later than June 30th. The last day of the school year is June 30. So the recommended quarterly dates are November 15th, January 31st, April 15th, and June 30. You don't have to use those dates. Those are just the recommended dates. You can use them if you want to. But like I said, if you school year round, that might be a little different. Like ours were in September, uh, early December, March, and then mid-June. And by mid-June, I, I was always done, so I wasn't too worried about that. For New York, grades one to, okay, so everyone has to do 180 days of school. How you do those 180 days is completely up to you. Um, for grades one to six, you are required to uh, complete 900 hours of schoolwork. Now, that is not sit down seat work. That is everything that you do. Uh, for grades seven to 12, it is 990 hours, and those are broken up divided by four over each quarter. After the quarterly report, at the end of the year, you have your annual assessment that's due. That is submitted along with your fourth quarter report. Now, depending on the grade, that is either going to be a written narrative or peer group review or a test. So normally in grades one to three, we say go ahead and do your written narrative. New York City has no problem with the parent writing the written narrative as of right now. That has not changed. Hopefully it doesn't. We like it like that. In grades four to eight, you are required to do a test every year. So an annual assessment is due every year. The type of annual assessment is what changes. So in grades four to eight, you can either do a written narrative or a test. So that's going to alternate. So you can do testing in four, six, and eight, and then years five and seven, submit a written narrative, or you can test years five and seven, and then do a written narrative for years four, six, and eight. Uh, testing is very simple. Most people use either the CAT or the PASS exam for their annual assessment. Um, there are others like the Iowa or the Stanford test. 
uh, you can send us questions on that. We can answer that another time because I don't want to go too deep into that because those get a little more complicated. And um, that's your annual assessment. And come July 1st, the whole thing starts all over again. So if you're going to continue homeschooling, those seven pieces of paperwork, your letter of intent, your IHIP, your quarterly reports, there's four of those, and your annual assessment, those have to be done every year. And uh, I think that's it. That was a very quick overview. I didn't go into detail with them, but I think I got the most of the basics. And um, yeah, like I said, if you guys, I do see that, I'll answer that later. Um, if you have questions, throw them into the chat box, uh, into the question and answer, and we'll come back to those. But yeah, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> all right. I'm going to um, thank you, Tina. I can never do all that that you just do. <laughs> I cannot keep on. I mean, I know what I'm doing. I just cannot keep it in my head to be able to verbalize it. I know what it is, but it's a lot to verbalize it. So kudos, Tina, because you got that, girl. <laughs> So I'm going to go through a couple of the bullet points that were on our flyer um, to talk that I said I would talk about. And one of those was how to organize your homeschool. Now, this is actually um, fairly easy um, because it's so individual. It's easy to talk about. Um, it's very individual. Um, just like your family is different than every other family we've ever known because you are you, um, how you organize your homeschool is going to be different. Um, where you organize your homeschool. Um, my homeschool started out, and I'm only going to talk about it for a little while. We started out at a desk in the living room with a chalkboard in front of it and books underneath where the seat had storage space. And we used part of the dining room table to hold extra equipment that we had. And we had a bookshelf and it was very organized and I only had one student at the time. Um, and I made her work at her desk because actually she's calling me now um, <laughs> um, because that's what I thought school was, that you had to work from a desk. There had to be a chalkboard involved with a teacher standing in the front because that's what I came from. Um, and it was very rigid and very difficult for us. Um, it turns out that my student, my daughter worked better on the side of my bed. Um, and I was, I didn't know that on in the first year until, you know, we were both crying a little bit because I was like, okay, go back to your desk, you do school now, made her get up and, you know, get dressed for school, come to realize she enjoys working in her pajamas a lot more and so did I. Um, so how we organize our homeschool really um, depends on you and how you organize. I think it should blend into your family life because I believe as my kind of philosophy for um, education is that education is our life. We're always learning, we're always growing. So our homeschool is spread throughout our home. I have some of their books in my bedroom. Um, some of the things that we do are in the kitchen because you know it makes more sense in there. A lot of it is at my, now my son's desk um, and spread throughout our bookshelves. We have something like 1500 books now. It's down from 3000, so we're, we're getting there. Um, but very different from, you know, say some moms that have a designated homeschool space where they have, you know, file folders that are colored, um, you know, marked perfectly for each class. I am not that rigid in how I organize. I'm, uh, Tina could tell you, I'm kind of loosey-goosey, um, but it works for us. And I know how to find things and I have trained the children well in taking care of their things. So we don't lose things very often. Um, and we have a lot of things because we've been homeschooling so long. So I would say for organizing your homeschool, think about how you organize. Um, if it's that you need a specific space, then go for it, have your specific space. If you are more a relaxed home, um, then see it as an opportunity to blend it into how you live. Um, I think that's all I have to say about organizing your homeschool. Um, if, if you are one of those people that can keep everything straight in a folder, do that. If you're like me and you have several books throughout the house that you pick up and you use for this class and that class, put them back and use a different one tomorrow, then, you know, be like me. But I wouldn't encourage anybody if you're not that person because it'll drive you crazy. Um, and then I'll, there's no questions right now. So I'll talk about... Um, that homeschooling multiple children, because I have done this with my three 
Uh, my oldest is 21 now. Uh, my middle daughter is 18 and my son is gonna be 13 in a couple of weeks. So there were times when I was homeschooling that I'm, I'm homeschooling two kids, maybe even a third all at the same time. And some people think, you know, I would get the question all the time, how do you do work with three children in three different grades that are very different, um, different learning styles, and also at different levels in, you know, whatever class we're working on. And I found that sometimes I could, I could put students together or my, maybe my two oldest could both be in a history class together. Um, and those generally look like I was reading and the oldest one was maybe taking notes while the younger one was asking questions. And I would ask her, what did you think about what we just you know, talked about rather than her taking notes? Because she wasn't quite there in her learning where she was taking notes on everything, but she could have ideas about what she heard. So I really wanted her thinking while we were working where the older one was taking notes and also asking questions. And the baby at the time would probably be listening or playing with blocks at the time. Um, so there were things I could do with all three. I was learning um, how to work with all of them and keeping them all engaged. Um, that, didn't, that didn't work with every subject. I'm not gonna tell you that every subject, you can do it with math, you can do it, no, you can't. Um, because they would be in different types of math. Or, I mean, I could probably do it with science because biology, everybody can learn about biology. Um, one can be looking into a microscope or another one could be reading to the group while the third one is um, pulling apart a flower. So you can do it in some classes. Um, and sometimes it's just about how you organize your time. So maybe the oldest is working on a different project entirely. Well, I'm giving time, FaceTime with my middle daughter and my younger one, he's got Legos, he loves Legos. Um, and he's building, and actually that worked out really well because now he puts together most of our furniture because he understood Legos and how you put together an entire steamboat or whatever. Um, <laughs> so now we get something from Ikea, I'm like, you handle it because you, you know how to do those things. Um, so working with multiples, it can work where you're working with them all together, or sometimes you're figuring out how to keep them occupied while you're working with one of their siblings or keeping them, maybe if it's a very young one, keeping them quiet for a little while and letting them learn patience. Mommy's working with big sis right now. Give me four minutes and maybe even give them a timer. So now they're learning the passage of time, which is important when you're little. They're all kind of lessons that they can be learning while they're waiting, while they're doing, while they're um, maybe even helping a sibling. I've had one sibling um, tutor another sibling because they, you got this last year or you got this two years ago. Can you talk to her about it? Uh, while I worked with your little brother on his handwriting. Um, so think about how you can maybe juggle their time and use their talents um, to help the family. Um, so that was how I homeschooled multiples. Um, and it was very successful <clears throat> for us. Um, you're gonna find it different. The same as I talked about individuality before about organizing your homeschool, individuality is very important in how you deal with your children in general. Uh, the way I deal with my kids, I don't think anybody else deals with their kids that way. Um, because I, you know, I'm filtering this through my knowledge of God, my knowledge of what my parents, how they've raised us, um, and also just all of the things that I bring to parenting. So you are the perfect teacher for your parent, for your children. Um, God put them in your house for a reason. And so the way I parent and the way I teach is, it's gonna be for these kids. Um, and I don't have any doubt about that now, that I'm a great teacher for them because I'm their mom, there's a reason for that. And I don't doubt that for a minute. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about quickly how to find a support group. That's usually the first thing I talk about. And then I'm gonna give it to you, Shalon, okay? So, um, finding support groups. And that's usually the first thing I talk about when um, I talk to new homeschoolers is you should find a support group, um, your tribe, I've been known to call it. Um, because even before you start homeschooling, finding people that have been successful in something that you wanna do is 
um, paramount. As sometimes we can have, you know, extended family that don't agree with the idea of homeschooling or think it's, you know, fringe or out there, or maybe even within ourselves, we may have doubts about whether we can do this or not. And you find a homeschool support group with tons of people that are, have been doing this for four years, you know, two years, 16 years, have graduated some kids. And that puts you in a different mindset where if it can be done by one person, then maybe I can do it and gives you a little bit more confidence. You have a, a group of people that can answer your questions like you get to, you know, ask today. Um, and you also get um, the opportunity to um, see how their children are doing. Um, when we have our picnics and things like that, and you get to see how they play together, that they're not weird. I mean, they may be weird, honestly, because people can be weird. Um, it's not a homeschool thing specifically. It's people can be introverts, people can be extroverts, people can be funny, people can be weird, people can be special. Um, and we see people in homeschooling support groups. So I'm not gonna say that there is no weird homeschooler. It's not true. Some of us are a little bit different. Some of us are a little odd. And that's fine because, you know, we're all, it takes a, a lot of different kinds of people to make up a whole world. So within the homeschool support, su support groups, you're going to see all kinds of people and how they're doing, how they're growing and how they're enjoying this journey. So finding a group, one that suits you is important. When I say suits you, I mean, um, there are groups that are going to be, um, more religious in you know the things that they do they will insist that you have to be this type of you know follow this type of religion or you have to um, be maybe jewish or you have to be um, a buddhist in order to be a part of our group um, there are groups like ours that you don't have to be specifically anything you just have to recognize that we are um, in our leadership Christian. Um, and so we may pray when likely we will pray when we start meeting. Um, and the name of Jesus comes up sometimes. Um, and this is how we are um, blessing this community. So knowing this and wanting to join us anyway, um, we've had atheists that have been a part of our group and um, Muslim people that have been a part of our group and happily homeschool their children right along with ours knowing that you know, we were doing this to bless the community and not trying necessarily to you know, get them to become Christian, but just love the homeschool community. Um, so maybe a religious group, or maybe you want a secular group specifically, or maybe you want a group of African-Americans, or maybe you want a group of, um, I don't know, people that live in a specific area. Finding the people that you wanna be around that are close to you, makes it more likely that you will be a part of the group, that you will hang out with them and get that information and that back and forth um, that you need to be supported. So I tell everyone, definitely find your group. And it's so much easier now than it was back when I started a million years ago because the internet was in its infancy. And now it's a whole big old world in there where you can definitely pull up tons and tons and tons of groups and get a sense of who they are because they have websites, they're on Facebook, they're on YouTube. So definitely find um, who you wanna be with, um, who you wanna be around, who you want your children and your family to be around and plug yourself in. Um, and I think that's all I have to say about that. I think we have to, to find a curriculum, but I think I might leave that one for you, Tina, and I'll let Shalom go next, okay? Hi, so I'm going to talk about outside classes. Um, I think the the biggest one of the things I learned quickly when I started homeschooling in New York City was that most homeschoolers are not sitting around their kitchen table all day doing homeschool, but they're actually going out and signing up for classes and doing things outside with other people. And that was kind of encouraging for me because I like to be, you know, busybody sometimes and I like to be out and about. So that was nice to know that I didn't have to like sit around my kitchen table all day. Um, now, obviously, because of just the state of where we are these days, a lot of outside classes might not be happening or happening in the way that they were. 
Um, depending on the groups that you're a part of, if you're part of NYCHEA or just different homeschool groups, they often have classes that are posted within those groups. So if you're someone who thinks, yeah, I really want to do some outside classes, I want to do some other things, I would suggest kind of joining some of those groups because there, there tend to be some really good classes that, that um, happen. It can be someone who is a college professor or a teacher or someone who majored in math and who's offering a math class or whatever. And you sign up for that class and your child either meets virtually or in person, however they're doing it. And does that class. Um, out school, I will say that is probably these days one of your best options. It's uh, O-U-T-S-C-H-O-O-L and they offer so many classes and you can categorize it or kind of streamline it to, ba to your child's age or grade. So you can, if you go on, uh, log into it you can say you know you have an 11 year old and a five year old and it'll give you a list of just classes that are geared to that age um you can refine it even more to specific types of classes but it's you i mean there's everything from dance classes to math classes to vocal lessons to learning how to play the ukulele to um there's just so many different things on there so i would say that's a great resource the cost ranges, I've noticed, I don't, I wouldn't say they're extremely high in terms of cost. Most of them are pretty reasonable. There are some that are a little, you know, pinch your pocket a little bit more than you might want it to, but most of them are pretty reasonable. And I think it's a great resource for testing out things too, right? Because you might have a kid that's like, oh, I'm interested in this. And you're like, hmm. But then you can just take an out school class for, you know, maybe for like a couple of weeks and see how they do. And if they really like it, then you can invest in it. Right. So I think it's a great opportunity to do that, to just see what they're interested in. Um, also, um, what else? Also, another option is uh, like a private tutor or teacher. Right. Sometimes you might like math is not my forte, you might say. Right. Like. I know for me, like beyond middle school math, I know that that's kind of my, my ceiling, right? I know, I know my, uh, <laughs> my limits. And so you might want to look into a tutor um, that can kind of supplement whatever they're doing in terms of curriculum or whatever you're doing in terms of curriculum. Um, or you might find someone who is available to teach math that's really good maybe someone who's a math major and they have some time and willing to teach and maybe they can come and work with you and if you've got a couple of other homeschool friends that are around the same age that want to do it together you can kind of do a little co-op with your you and your your tribe as uh, um jackie was talking about before and you can do a math class together so there are a lot of really different ways to do outside classes i think sometimes the biggest misconception about homeschooling is that everything absolutely has to be done by the parent and it doesn't, um, unless you want it to, but most of us don't want to. So um, you can definitely seek outside um, resources, and it's perfectly fine. And the one of the plus about, pluses about living in New York City is there is so much available to us um, out in the city. And so take advantage. I mean, there are organizations there are like the New York Historical Society who has done classes, history classes for quite a few years now for homeschoolers, just for homeschoolers. Um, there are a lot of different courses and classes out there that are available specifically for homeschoolers and sometimes not necessarily specific to homeschoolers, but your homeschooler can definitely take advantage and be a part. So that is what I would say about outside classes. Um, high school, homeschool and high school, is that what I'm talking about? So, <laughs> um, whew. so homeschooling high school, I think, I know for me, it, the idea was daunting. Like when I thought about like kindergarten through eighth grade, I was like, okay, I think I can figure this. But the closer I got to high school, I was a little like, this is real because they might want to go to college and can I prepare them for that? You know, it was, it's a little daunting. I would say a couple of things. One, um, have a conversation with your high schooler prior to get an idea of what they want to do, get an idea of what they're thinking, um, what they like, and kind of go from there, right? Like you want to, you know, the things that high schoolers are supposed to know and learn. And then you kind of say, hey, this, and this is what I did with mine. I'd say, okay, these are the things, these are the subjects that you're supposed to learn in high school. 
but when do you want to do them? We can kind of choose to do them when you want to do them. Do you want to do this this year or next year? Also, figure out the things that they really like and enjoy and incorporate that into their high school life. Um, what I found is the more involved you get them in their curriculum, in their learning, the more it's your less headache for you, right? Because there's buy-in. I always say it's similar to like when you um, have your kid help you cook, right? When you're cooking a meal and they're like, oh, I don't want that. But then when you have them help you prep it and make it and cook it, then they're like, oh, I want to eat it, right? They're excited because they have a hand in it. And I think that's the same with learning, right? If they have a more of a hand in feeling like, yes, this is what I chose, this is what I want to do, they're more likely to be excited and be a part of it. Um, also, what you do with them is will also be determined of what their goal is once they've graduated, right? If they, if your child is like, I don't really want to go to college, maybe I want to go to trade school or I want to just go to work, then that'll determine and give you more flexibility on what high school will look like for them, right? Because you're not having to um, have them serve certain things to um, appease to a college or what, they, what they're looking for. Or you might have a child that wants to go to college, but maybe a liberal arts college, right? Nothing that's like super um, uh, scientific or anything like that. So then that'll determine the type of high school that they will have, they'll do. And then if you've got that kid that's like, I want to be an astrophysicist and I want to go to the moon and this is what I want to do, then that's high school has got to look a certain way, right? So you've got to make sure that you have the sciences and it can't just be like, you know, general science, it's got to be like physics. It's got to be the actual sciences that are going to be required for them to get into those types of programs. They've got to have the math, right? Like they've got to have the actual math classes that they need. So a lot of what their high school will look like can be determined on what their future is and what they're thinking their future wants, they, they want it to be. Um, if you have an artistic child, then you will do some more artistic things that will be part of their curriculum in addition to the basic math and science and history and stuff that they need to learn. But you want to make sure that, that there is time in their day for drawing and for painting or for if they're more musical, for singing and learning notes and playing an instrument. Like that needs to be part of their day as well because if they're planning on going to college in an arts college, they've got to be able to show that they have these things and they know these things, right? Um, there's so much more I could say, but I think that's kind of like a, a gist. I hope that was helpful. Um, and I can answer some questions afterwards if there's more um, info that I need to help with. So, Can I add to that one just a little bit? Yeah. So, um, because we both had these um, kids that have made it through and graduated and gone out to college or decided not to, because I have one that went and decided not to after. Um, and one that is in right now and um, uh, loves it and wouldn't do anything differently. And one was my artistic kid and one the other one was my um, academic. But both of them, um, even though, you know, the one decided after, they both took classes before going to college so that they can get an opportunity to um, see what that was like. And the program that um, New York has that's free um, is, um, college now. So that's definitely if if you have one that is college bound or considering college, it's free in New York, even the um, textbooks are free. Um, and it's at the CUNY schools that are offering it. I, it's a lot of them. Um, and my legal kid decided to go to um, Baruch and John Jay for hers and ended up with something like 12 credits before she ever um, graduated high school. And those were free credits to her. She did the work. She got an idea of what college was like as far as sitting in front of a professor, no one, you know, following through. I mean, as a homeschool child her entire life, she did fantastic, um, considering that this was her first time in a college setting and had really no problems with it. But that is, you know, both of them did really well in it. So I would encourage anybody that has one that's interested in going to college or considering it to try out the College Now program. I mean, there are other ways to um, get credits too, um, and Shalon knows that, I'm sure Tina does too, where you can um, take tests and you know clip out of 
college um, classes, so they won't need them and they get the credits for them. Um, it's cheaper than college classes. So there are ways to um, build up even their high school transcripts with those college credits that may be free or may have you know, spent a lot less time and money than they would have doing it in college. So I would encourage anyone that you know is thinking that way to definitely try those two resources out, CLEP and um, College Now for homeschooling a uh, high schooler. And maybe at some point we'll, Shalon, um, do like a longer version of the high school one, because there's a lot um, that goes into that one. And it's, I, I don't think we ever get an opportunity to really like talk about it in, in total because when we do these one-on-ones, it's for everybody. Um, so maybe that's something we'll think about in the future is doing one specifically for high schoolers. And we may have to um, involve some other moms that have had different experiences than we had um, because it, it's, it's, again, individual. Um, and so it can be very different depending on what you're doing. As Shalon mentioned that earlier, with you know what your student is planning on doing and how high school will look for them. And that's super important because I had one artistic kid. Um, she was good at her academics, but the other one needed heavy academics in order to get into the schools that she was working on. And finding out from the schools was important for that. Um, do we have anything else that we had on our list that we wanted to talk about before we do um, the two and three? Did we talk organization? We did talk organization, but you were going to do curriculum. I was doing curriculum? Yeah. Are you sure about that? I'm so sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so honestly, curriculum is so, it. I want to say it's easy, but if you're the parent trying to do this for your child, you're probably thinking it's not that easy. With the required subjects that are listed in the regulations, um, New York state gives you required subjects. The topics that you decide to cover are completely up to you. And I saw some of the questions, so that'll go into that and I'll answer those questions more in depth later. But um, like I said, you, you finding a curriculum, it's really about finding what's gonna work for you and your child and also depends on what your style is as a parent. Um, I know there are, there are unschoolers in New York, there are, I'm not an unschooler. I can't even give you, I can point you in the right direction. Trust me, I'm not an unschooler. Unschooling is very child-led. I am not that mom. <laughs> um, I'm like, no, we're doing this and that's it. I will ask him what he wants to learn and we will include that, but we're doing all this other stuff as well. Uh, I am more of a Charlotte, Charlotte Mason style um, homeschooler. We're doing very short lessons. We hit a little bit of everything each day. For new homeschoolers, I usually recommend they start with something like easy peasy, allinonehomeschool.com, only because one, it's free. Two, it covers all of the required subjects for New York out, outside of the New York State History and Constitutions. But all of the other subjects that New York requires is covered in that program. So for someone who's just um, starting out and is already overwhelmed and doesn't want to have to think too much, Easy Peasy is a very nice place to start where you can just put your child there, you work through it with them, especially for the younger ones, because you know they go off on tangents, but it allows them to work through while you get your feet wet, figure out how the paperwork works, figure out if that program works for you. Um, Easy Peasy does go all the way through high school if you decide to use that, or as you get more confident and you branch out, you use other programs and maybe you use only pieces of it, portions. So um, with resources and curricula that in New York, it kind of, it's kind of, you'll hear homeschoolers say curricula or resources and they kind of use them interchangeab interchangeably. However, as long as you are covering the required subjects, you can use anything you want for homeschooling. Uh, New York City has, great libraries. Um, in Brooklyn and New York City, you get uh, an, an educator card that allows you to borrow the materials for two months at a time and renew them for another two months at a time. So um, take advantage of that. The, the libraries are great resources. The interlibrary system in which I miss you guys, you have no idea, not in New York anymore. I miss the library system because 
I, you, if you want a particular book, they will send it to your local library and you can pick it up there. So, I mean, I love that. Take advantage of your library system. Um, but yeah, with the curriculum there, I, I would say find what works for you and your kids. If you're going to be child led and, and you're letting your child lead and what their interests are, find resources, go to the libraries, go to search the different websites, find the stuff that your child's going to be interested in learning. If you are the mom, if you are parent led, then find what's going to work for you, for you to be able to teach your children and go with that. There are so many different resources. You can do homeschooling absolutely free, or you can spend thousands of dollars. Um, with a note on the curriculum, I know we always get a lot of questions about the, the private schools. New York does not, let me rephrase that, private online correspondence schools. New York does not recognize online schools. You can use those schools as your homeschool curriculum, but um, you are still responsible to submit all the paperwork. I've had a few parents come to me and tell me, well, this school said I didn't have to submit paperwork. Yes, you do. I don't care what the school says. New York does not recognize online schools for, for homeschooling. Um, if you are not in a brick and mortar school, they, you're homeschooling. So you can use any resource you want. You can use any of the private online schools if you want to pay for those. Um, you have a Becca, you have BJU, you have uh, the more literally private schools that they're online schools. Your child is enrolled in that school and you're paying a private tuition for it. You can use that, but you still have to submit. You are still required to submit homeschool paperwork. You're just listing that this is the resource that you're using. Um, Curriculum is a huge topic. Uh, like I said, you just kind of got to do a little bit of research, find what works best for you. I am trying, to, I have a link to a um, homeschool quiz <laughs> that tells you what kind of teacher, uh, parent and learner that your child is, um, as well as what kind of teacher you are. So if I can find that link, I will link it into the, into the chat box. But yeah, I'm very, very simply, as long as you cover the required subjects in your plan, then you can use any resource you want. Um, and being locked into the plan, I will say on your IHIP, I usually include a state that a statement that says this plan is subject to change as for my child's needs. Only because some people think that once they put that plan into place, they're locked into it. No, you're not. You can, when you get to your, your it's your plan for the year, but it's not locked in stone. When you submit your quarterly reports, your quarterly reports are going to say, well, this is what we actually did. And if we had to make a change, this is the change we made. So just trying to get that out there. I do see more questions coming in and we'll get to those. But yeah, that's that's about it for curriculum. You can use any resource you want. You can use any style you want. You just have to make sure that it's covered in the paperwork when you submit it. All right. There was something I was going to add to that too. Um, that's a little bit different um, when you get to high school, um, where you know you can. Um, I I didn't change their curriculum too much without putting in like an amendment because I wanted everything to be just so with high school. Um, I was very careful when it came to their high school, and then I was also very careful even about the the curriculum we use because this is what the colleges may look at later. Um, and decide, you know, between this kid that used, you know, this really impressive text versus this kid that um, used a New York Times journal <laughs> to cover their, you know, curriculum for it. So I was really careful when it came to high school, what kind of things we chose, especially for my academic kid. With the artist kid, I actually didn't need, they barely looked at her transcript. They were much more interested in her portfolio and could she art? Um, and that's where a lot of our work came in. Although her, you know, transcript was great, her portfolio is what they really wanted to see. Um, yeah. My academic kid, they wanted all the academics. They wanted to know what did we use. And we were um, creating along the way um, two things. And I'll talk about high school just quickly again, because I'm in the middle of it. Yes, I want to add on to that. Just like like Shalon was saying, Shalon <laughs> was saying that conversation for high school is very important because you need to know: Do I have a kid like mine 
who is going a general path, like really doesn't know what they want, but knows they don't want to go to college and that could change. So cover the basics. Or do I have a kid that I, I know this is my college bound kid. This is my studious kid. What is necessary? You kind of need to know that upfront because those two paths are going to be entirely different in how you approach that high school career. And I'm going to call it a career because there's some work involved. Um, if you know you have a, a studious child that is that college is their goal, then you want to start early and start fleshing out what colleges uh, they are interested in or what types of colleges and start looking at those websites and finding out what do they require from homeschoolers because the homeschool requirements for a college is different from someone shouldn't be but are many times different from what someone who attended a regular brick and mortar public school is going to be so you need to know what those differences are so that you can make sure you hit all those points and beyond of what that what that career is going to look like. Absolutely. I mean, and I think if you're, um, if, if you're working with one of those like um, super powered kids, I have one, uh, just one, thank God, um, that really wanted college and already knew her trajectory and was probably going to be president. Um, and it, you know, she knew what went into it and it was making her nervous that I was so laid back. Um, definitely we were doing hitting all of the you know right notes when it came to her homeschool and then I was you know outsourcing and getting help because she was like mommy are you sure and I'm like I don't know um but definitely getting the extra classes she needed setting her in front of um lawyers actually getting her you know an internship at the Queen's DA's office so that she could be around lawyers found lawyers in our community and had her sit with them um, and definitely pulling her into that world so she could see it and know, yeah, this is what I want. Um, and then what do I have to do to get your job was her question often. Um, and you know, what, do, what classes do I have to take? What other jobs should I be looking for in order to get where you're at? And if you have a kid like that, these are the questions that they're asking. Um, there was something that, I wanted, I wanted to look at the questions because a lot of them were like qualified. I, I was going to ask the same thing. I saw a question that I wanted to answer, if that's okay. Yeah, definitely. Is it in the chat? In the Q&A. &A. Yeah, someone asked about they have a child who's in their last year of high school and should they take the SAT or ACT? And the answer is if they're planning to go to college, yes because college is required. Um, so if your child wants to go to college, then yes, they should take the SAT or ACT or both. If you have that kid that wants to take both and kind of see how they do, um, they can do that. There are some more and more colleges that are um, not looking at that as much, giving you the option to apply without. But I will say that a lot of the schools that say, hey, you can opt out of having taken showing the SAT or ACT will just go based on your transcript. A lot of those do not apply to homeschoolers. So you want to check that, right? So if there's a school, let's say, I don't know, University of Illinois, just thinking of something, right? And that's where your child wants to go. And they're one of the schools that are like, you can opt out from having an SAT or ACT. You want to look on their website and check to see if that it is also including homeschools because a lot of times it isn't. And to be honest, it's because for them, that is their way to really see how they are in terms of academically, right, based on that test. And so that's why it doesn't apply to the homeschoolers. Um, so with that being said, yes, they should, if they're planning to go to school, they should. I will add, if your child is a little bit more flexible in where they want to go, if they want to go specifically to a Christian college, um, that is that's and that's where they want to go. They don't want to go to any other types of schools. Then there's a third option called the CLT, and it kind of came out a few years ago, but most of the Christian colleges accept it. And so, if that is your child, then you can have them take that in addition to the SAT and ACT, because they take those as well, or you can just have them take that if that's their own route. But if they're planning on going to college, they definitely need to take one of those tests. 
And just to add on to that, if they were interested in going to college now, then they would have to the SAT. So it, it's like a pre-SAT class. Um, or, so if, you know, they're thinking about being college bound, they should, you know, definitely be looking into the test, um, checking on at the, um, I think it's college board's um, website and looking at the test prep, you know, information they have there. So definitely doing that if they are interested in college. Um, Liza also asked about whether her student needs to take algebra, um, geometry for math, um, and bio and chem for science. And I think that um, goes back to what you said earlier, um, Shalon, about what they're trying to accomplish. Like right. if they are going to college and they know that they're going to college and it's not, I, I would say any college, you would need those classes um, having, having had taken those. So I would go to, again to the college's website and see what they are um, asking for. I think for high school, they have to take three years of math, three years of math or four years of math, um, just to two years of math. Um, <laughs> I say that because I had like this number two high strung and she was like, can I take five years of math? I'm like, you're only doing for four years. Are you kidding me? Um, so um, she just was trying to cover all bases exceptionally. Um, but I would say if they're college bound, then, then definitely they're going to meet the higher maths and the higher sciences. Um, I would say, I, I think you also mentioned um, financial literacy. I think every kid needs that anyway. So as a homeschooler, I was like definitely going to get financial literacy um, anyway, even if that was going to be an add on to the maths that they were already taking, because they need to know what a checkbook is. They need to know about car insurance. They need, to, these are all things that should happen at our table. These are things that, you know, they should learn. So this, you know, I think they call it, um, it's not personal finances, but it's like everyday finances. Um, and we did several classes in economics and what that looks like for, you know, personal saving. Um, what is the idea of budgeting? Um, and that was part of our homeschool in general because our homeschool wasn't just academics, it was life skills, um, including chores at home, life skills. Um, I also thought swimming was a life skill. Not everybody agrees with me, but that was important. It was like way up there for me. Like no kid in mind is ever gonna be a weak swimmer. I was a weak swimmer. That was probably more me than them. But, um, you know, at, definitely with economics, they need to know these things. They need to know what the stock market is. Even if we, you know, play with investing a little bit of money and see what that looks like. Have a stake in it. Um, Shalon mentioned a buy-in so that they are actively paying attention to what's going on in whatever area. They got bank accounts when they got their first job um, that you know my name was on so that we can work with that together as part of homeschooling. So some things are just gonna be life skills. Um, but for college, those higher maths and higher sciences, they have to be included. Um, the DOE does give us a, a list of the classes that students should take. But more importantly, if they're going to college, see what the colleges want. Um, Amy asked, do we need to keep an attendance record? They send us a, a, an attendance record, right? They, they do. I will tell you the simplest way of keeping an attendance record is just keeping a calendar. Um, so, okay, so let's say for New York City, they've never asked for an attendance record. I know there have been districts that do ask. So the simplest way to do it is to get a calendar and any day that you don't do school, put an X on that one because you're going to do school way more often than you don't do it. And then you can just send them a copy of that and say, yep, whatever is, is not marked, those are the days we had school. In many cases, people send a blank calendar because we're homeschoolers. Homeschooling happens every day. We don't have absent days unless the like well like a friend of mine was saying last night unless someone is in the hospital and they're definitely not doing anything, we're learning every day. So every day is a homeschool day for us. 
even our vacations often had homeschool days associate we took the kids cross country in an rv that was one big homeschool day like we were looking at maps we were visiting the biggest like lawn chair in the world um all kinds of things and investigating the world. And I consider that entire vacation, if you could call it that RV with the family in the car all day, all night, um, a vacation, but it was all homeschool related as far as I was concerned. They were reading all day. Um, they were interacting and talking about, you know, what happens in Texas. Let's talk about Texas because that's where we're headed to next. Um, so definitely, you know, keep track of it, but there were less days we weren't homeschooling um maybe the weekend but even then we would you know go to the park and do all kind of things that could be homeschool related um even if they cooked for the little ones there was measuring involved there was science involved <laughs> so a lot of things can be homeschool depending on the grade that you're working with um, so Juana has a question yeah. I'm looking at that right now. Juana, um, testing, it's, okay, so here's the testing. With testing, your child has to score 33% or better on the testing. Um, HSLD is correct. is correct. If it's your first year homeschooling and you are in grades four through eight, you are not required to test this year. If for any reason that you think your child might be an anxious test taker or a poor test taker, then go ahead and have them test um, and you just don't submit it. You submit when required. Testing is every other year, but every other year you also need, to, if you're not testing, then that means you're doing a written narrative in those grades. Um, you, can, you can submit the test every year if you want to, that is not required for those grades. Uh, if you decided to test this year, then next year you can do the written narrative or you can do the written narrative this year and then next year you test. Like I said, if you think that your child may not do well on those tests, then I would recommend testing every year. Only submit when necessary, but let's say your child, let's say you tested this year and your child scored 25%. Um, let's say it's just fourth grade. So that means next year in fifth grade, your child scored below. Next year in fifth grade, the, the, you need to have, you need to be able to show either they've passed the exam or you show one year of growth. If you have a child that has scored below, the way to show one year of growth is next year when you test for fifth grade, let's say they said they scored 25% again, scoring 25% in fourth grade and then scoring on the test in fifth grade 25% or better shows the one year growth. So next year you would send in both exams, the current and the previous year so that you stay out of probation. That's a whole other conversation. So I'm not gonna go into too, into too much detail with that. But um, yeah, the, the testing is every other year. When you get to high school, then it's every year that you have to submit testing. And we actually test every year because I don't feel like doing the um, written narrative <laughs> anymore. I think well, I, have I mean, with all those <laughs> kids and written narratives. Um, but we, we do test every year, though. You don't have to. Um, it's just easier. And it also keeps my kids, um, they kind of like testing. Not every child does. I found out with my second one that they enjoyed testing. Um, she can be a nervous test taker. So allowing her every year to like get her nerves out and get the work done and then feel amazing when she gets her results back, it was easier for us. But again, it's individual. So if that's not the kid you're working with, then you know maybe you don't test every year and you take advantage of that written narrative that you can do. Or once we're you know, up and kicking again, maybe um, Bikulia will be doing our um, peer review panel and we can help with that. But that's another option that we'll talk about at another time. All right, um, Liza asked, what group um, gives outside classes? I think that was to Shimon. Yep, so um, outschool.com, I think Tina put it in the chat, is the main one that I was talking about. And outside of that, I would say just a lot of homeschool groups, right? So Nychia, Queens Homeschoolers, Park Slope Homeschoolers, there are just a lot of um, homeschool groups out there. And within those groups, they tend to have classes or field trips that they organize or put together. So just look out for them 
and find. And if you can't find it, then make your own. Um, I've done that before. I knew someone who was good at sewing, who had a sewing school, and my daughter wanted to learn. And I figured there might be some other homeschoolers that want would too. I asked her, would you be willing to teach some homeschoolers? And she did. And so for about, I don't know, four or five years consecutively, she did homeschool classes, sewing classes to homeschoolers. Um, so if you can't find the class you're looking for, then create it. And I would add on to that, Shalon, there are um, other resources besides just homeschool groups, like homeschool groups are yep. awesome. And yep. sometimes they'll do field trips and sometimes they'll have classes within that um, group, be it co-op, which we didn't really talk about, or um, they'll have, you know, where they invite someone in to teach a specific class. And those are great. But we also live in New York City. Yep. Um, and when it's not pandemic times, I can speak more to that because we haven't done a whole lot out during pandemic time. Um, but there are art classes galore. They're in museums, um, in studios where art classes are happening. My oldest, who was my artsy kid, took um, classes in a college. Um, the School of the Visual Arts had them for younger students. Um, and the Met has art classes. Like, everywhere has art because it's an artsy town so you know a quick google search of art classes for kids will give you a list in new york city um if you're looking for dance classes those might be a little bit more pricey i'm going to tell you ahead of time but they are available um if you are looking for chess um think about parks department the parks department has a huge array of classes that they offer not pandemic times but in general, and they may be offering some now, I don't know about every single Parks Department location, um, but we've taken Taekwondo, we've taken swim, learn to swim, we've taken art, we've taken um, tennis. Skateboarding. Um, skateboarding, bike riding, track and field, golf. And that's just to name a few. Um, so Parks Department is um, an amazing resource um, outside of your homeschool groups, because even for Brooklyn Queens Leah, well, we offer, I think, um, with our coach, Danny, we've had soccer, basketball, and um, touch football. Uh, we've had swim, and we've had um, ice skating. Um, and I think that's it. Um, soft, did I say soccer? So we offer, like, these sports. But um, on top of that, you've got parks department, and it's all free through parks department. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of it is free with us. And, I, and I'd like to add to that. Um, if you have a science child, someone who's like super loves science, the Museum of Natural History has great science classes that are free, that are amazing. Um, my kid took for, I don't know, the last two years of high school, maybe. They're like science classes just for high school children that are like after school hours, right? So it's open to all high schoolers, not just homeschoolers. And um, at the you, you sign up and they give you all the, like the different lists of science classes that they have available and you pick the science class. And he did that probably for the last two or two and a half years of high school. So like Jackie said, there's so being in New York City is I think a little bit of a blessing for, I mean, a lot bit of a blessing, honestly, not a little bit, um, because there's just so much available to us. But yeah, if you have a science child, the Museum of Natural History has a great resource. And there's actually another program that they offer. I can't think of the name of it now, but you apply when you're headed into your fifth grade year. So if you've got a younger kid who's super science, I believe, and you can just Google, go into the website, you apply the year before your fifth grade year. And if you make it in, it's a program that you stay in from that grade all the way through high school. And it's amazing. They do so much and they have like, and again, it's free. They have like classes and workshops and it's this whole thing that follows you through. But if you have a child who's super into science and think that's what they want to do and they might want to apply to like college later on, science related, that's the kind of program you want to get them into. So definitely just use the city at, at, you know, as your resource and just Google, see what's out there. And because there, there is a lot out there and there's a lot that will not break your bank, but that are super amazing and high quality and will give them the education they need. And I just added a couple to the chat also. Um, I think we probably me and Shalon could do this all day. <laughs> We're like, oh yeah, wait, and this one too, and this one too. 
Um, the Explorers program was an amazing um, program in the city where, you know, they had the kids in a courthouse and they went to the Queen's DA's office. So if you got a legal one like I had, um, that was fantastic. But they also took them into Whole Foods, into the kitchen, where they got to make food and see how that area was run. And I think they also took them to um, a Hilton Hotel, where they got, um, they got, they, they didn't call it like martinis, but it was some kind of like non-alcoholic one. And mocktail, maybe? Yeah, mocktail. Yeah. And they had like little finger sandwiches and stuff, and they showed them what was hospitality industry in New York City. Um, LaGuardia Airport, too, is another one. Yeah, and I think there's aviation as well. Um, there are all kind of programs, um, and through Explorers, it's free and it's spectacular. Um, and one last one was the Baruch Step Academy, which was another one that my, um, my little one took advantage of for several years. Um, so when we say there are a lot of programs in the city um, geared toward high schoolers, and that's not even talking about coding and what Microsoft is doing and Black Girls at Code and um, Black Girls Rock. There are, I know about Black girls because I raised two Black girls, but there are tons of other programs <laughs> that are available to um, just everyone in New York. So where, you know, I've spoken to homeschoolers that live upstate and out of the city, and they can't believe that anyone would homeschool in a city. And they're like, really? How does that even work? You're in like an apartment. You're not even on a farm. And I'm like, I can't imagine being on a farm and doing what we do because we get to touch everything. There's archery, there's horseback riding in the city if you're you know, that kind of person. Or you, know, you can hit the museum mile and enjoy your time you know, in some of the most amazing museums in the world. Um, so homeschooling in New York is a dynamic thing. So don't let anybody make you feel bad about it because I will not. Um, <laughs> we have a, a couple more questions. Um, and I'm sorry, Tina, because you moved to Jersey, but. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, my homeschool budget has gone up. I miss all the free activities we had in New York because it is crazy out here. Um, it says, I see for social studies that they have so many topics to cover. Do you have to cover the, those all in one year or just one topic? Per year? I'm assuming those are the topics for high school because high school is the only one that tells you you have certain things. So high school social studies requires one year of US history, half a year of government, half a year of economics, uh, which can be combined with that financial literacy class that we were talking earlier. And then you have two years of electives. If you follow the public school system, those two year electives of history is usually the two years they take for global history. So um, they don't all have to be done in one year. I would definitely not do them all in one year unless you have a social, uh, a kid who's into history. And then they'll spend as much time as they want on it. And you can. Um, but yeah, those are designed to be spread out over the years. Um, that's one thing I didn't talk about when we, when we talked about the required subjects. When you get to seven and eighth grade and then the high school grades that talk about units, one unit is usually one full year of the school year. So 108 hours. I know the, the regulations listed in minutes. It's just easier for me to think of it in hours. It's 108 hours minimum to award that credit to your to your child. So yeah, those do not have to be covered all in one year. Um, Amy, they can be spread out usually for each year. In the chat, she's saying that she meant for elementary. Elementary, oh, elementary says, it says US history and geography. And then it also says, which is kind of funny because it says, um, Oh, how did they put it? Um, New York history. New York history and constitutions has to be covered at least once between grades one and eight. U.S. history kind of gets funny because you can cover any history you want, but you see it's listed in the regulations and then it's listed it has to be covered once. The way I've told parents to get around that is list whatever history that you want. New York City's not going to give you an issue with it. They don't care. I don't. I honestly don't believe they read our stuff, but that's a whole other issue. Um, if you are outside of the city and they are telling you that you have to do that requirement, then simply saying we're going to cover U.S. holidays and that'll cover your, your U.S. history requirement if you're doing something like 
uh, world history or government history, or you know, you're doing a different type of history than U.S. history. Um, to get out of that, it they give you the subjects. They don't tell you how much time you have to spend on it. So you can do a U.S. history. You can do a U.S. history, and um, it can be we're covering all the U.S. holidays this year, and that's our history, our U.S. history for that year. In addition to we're doing world history or something like that. So you have many ways to. Um, work around those. It's New York gives you the requirements, but the flexibility in those requirements are so much that there's a lot of different ways you can do it. Um, someone mentioned, do we meet in only at Forest Park? And I'll just uh, mention that we don't usually, we don't usually tell everyone where we meet or when we're meeting there. <laughs> um, and because it's an anonymous attendee, um, not only that, but it's going on, you know, YouTube. But we don't generally, just for the protection of our families, we don't tell everyone where we're going to be or when exactly we're going to be there. But Forest Park is one of the parks that we do meet at. Um, and a couple of other locations between Brooklyn and Queens, just like our name suggests. So um, not necessarily a one more so than the other one, depending on what's available, what's open to us. Um, so I hope that kind of answers. Yeah, that was Amy. Amy, I mean, really, we meet all over. Um, we have so many different, I keep saying we, because, you know, y'all are my family. <laughs> I miss you guys. But um, the Brooklyn Queens Leah meets wherever we can get people together. You know, it's it's Brooklyn Queens. We've got, we've done trips to Manhattan. We've done, we've done trips to upstate. So it just depends on what the activity is and where we, if it's a location required activity, where we happen to meet. So it's, it's and all over. Jersey. <laughs> we can now. <laughs> we took the moms to Jersey last year. Um, and then we have a question. How does Peculia assist with completing the annual assessments? Um, we don't. Right. <laughs> Honestly, if you, okay. So I, that's a very tongue in cheek answer. We don't help you. We don't help you do the paperwork, but if you are a BQLEA member and you need help, ask in the group, someone's gonna help. So, you know, um, we don't, unless you're referring to the peer group review, if we do that this year, then that's a different story. With a peer group review written narrative, um, you bring your child's work for the year. We have experienced and veteran homeschool moms that will go over that work, they'll assess your child, and then the lead person will write that written assessment for you and send you a copy and be clear keeps a copy. But other than that, um, school and any suggestions we might have based on what we've seen um, that doesn't get added into our assessment necessarily, unless it really should in order to help um, along things. But um, we try to you know, be as helpful in, in that way. Um, letting you know what we see, what you know, what we think. We'll even ask, you know, you know, what field trips you've been on, or uh, what instrument does your student like to play, and um, just all kind of things in that one, just to get a vast understanding of what you're doing, um, and then give you our. Um, it's not professional. Is it professional opinion? Our <laughs> our opinion based on experience. All right, and I'm just scrolling through here, looking through the chat. Nazira, um, so yeah, if you submitted the letter of intent on June 9th, the previous school year was not completed yet, so I'm not surprised that you did not get a response. Um, if you're in New York City, I would go ahead and send Mr. Harrington an email and ask him, hey, I sent my letter of intent, just want to make sure it was received, or just go ahead and send in your IHIP and... Um, if they didn't receive your letter of intent, they'll get back to you. But I would just go ahead and send in your IHIP and or send Mr. Harrington an email, a direct email, and just confirm that they received it, especially if your child was in school because you want to make sure that they're withdrawn from the public school system. Um, and in the Q&A, I mentioned it's anonymous. So yes, our members do get invited um, via email to our events. Um, very specifically because we don't want to give out to the general public that we will have young school-age children running around a park at this particular time 
Um, they will be attended by parents, but they'll be there. No, we don't want to make those kind of announcements, but our membership does know where to meet up, um, what we're going to be doing, how long we're going to be there. So yes, um, they get def different um, information than the general public does just for protection of our kids and our parents too. Okay, I'm gonna leave this to one of you guys to answer, but Belgica asks, I'm a first time homeschooling mom, but I have a high school senior and junior. What do you recommend regarding curriculum? I, well, for us, I mean, again, that's kind of individual. Um, for us, we were always super eclectic, depending on what, um, on the particular student. Uh, we've used different curriculums. I like the Becca for a little while. I have come to um, not love them so much for everything. I mean, we didn't use it for everything, but I would use them for, I think at one point, science and history, and then didn't really like them for history anymore. Um, and so my third child will not really be seeing Rebecca stuff for history um, moving forward, but maybe for science, but I'm also pulling from other resources. Um, I don't necessarily recommend one or another. What I do recommend is if you are in a tribe, a group, um, to ask moms in the group, you know, can I look at yours? Or uh, what did you like? Like we liked the Becca for a long time. And then I started seeing things that I didn't really agree with um, from you know, my standpoint and where I am right now. Um, and I wanted to extend some things and we tried you know, different things um, as we move forward. I don't know about, what about you, Sharon? What did you guys use? Um, yeah, we're pretty eclectic too. We've never like been connected to one set curriculum. We did do classical conversations for a little bit of time um, when they were a little bit younger. And for our now college child, we did it for the last two years of high school because it just seemed to make more sense for what he was trying to do and the things that he wanted to learn. Um, so, but yeah, I, I always, when we started out, we just asked people that we knew, hey, what did you like for English? What did you like for math? What did you, why did you like it? And if I heard more than a few people mention one thing, then I gave it a try and see if my children liked it as well. So I don't have one set curriculum that I would recommend because really it depends on your family and your child. Because um, what I love, you might try and you might not like at all. And your child might say, why are we doing this? So it really is kind of talking to people that maybe have children similar to yours or similar interests, see what their child liked, what the family liked and kind of go from there. Yeah, definitely. And that is again, part of being part of a tribe. You have those opportunities to reach out to people. Um, in Brooklyn, Queens, Leah, I'm like, send out an email to the group and see what you get back. See who has you know different types of answers with regard to this question. Um, sometimes I will answer them, you know, directly because maybe it, you know, we could have asked it outside of the group or um, if you're at our picnic or if you're at, you know, one of our events, our monthly meetings or something like that, then you have access to all these people doing all these different things. So definitely um, in any group you're in, try to find some people that are, you know, supportive in that way and they want to um, help you out with you know, finding a good curriculum, because we all know sometimes it's very difficult, even with one child, to find a curriculum that works, let alone when you have multiples and different personality types or different learning styles, or even, you know, if you have a special needs child versus um, one that is not. So definitely asking about. Um, is there anything else? Did we miss yeah, anything? there was. I want to know what you guys did. I did put a link in the chat um, it wasn't the resource I used. Someone asked, how do you cover New York state history and constitutions? I know we used around New York in 80 days and unfortunately they are not in print anymore. If you contact the publishers, they might send you a copy of the, of the book, um, but there are certainly other ways. So I was wondering how you guys had covered that. Um, I, I, I wanna say we have a book, but it's been a little while, a couple of years since um, I looked at it. And we did um, actually 
going to places like we did city hall and we went to um, a lot of these kind of historic places because it's New York City um, and checked out and went into the library to look around. Um, we looked at the constitution, we actually did that um, and talked about what a constitution was, even New York's personal constitution. We talked about what that means. And I, I wanna say for the middle one, we even like wrote up what could be her own personal constitution. If she had a family, what would the constitution look like in that space? Um, to look at constitutions, not just like the country's constitution, but what does our state constitution look like? What is a constitution? Um, so we took it from a different direction than just a curriculum that um, would talk to us about it, where we touch constitutions. I yeah, I don't remember and, what we did, but I would say you can try um, New York Historical Society is another good resource and see what they have. Um, they might be able to, they have like, you can, I mean, one, it's just a nice little museum to go to. They have a lot of like New York history um, and books and those kind of things, but then they also offer classes and stuff. So, um, and resources, they have like, a, if I remember correctly, they have like a library in there. I don't think you can take books out, but you can kind of see things. So that is another option for New York history. And I think also we, um, with Leah, our umbrella organization from School New York, they have, um, they go to Albany pretty much every year and they talk to our representatives there. So if you wanna talk about on the state level, that was a great trip for my, um, actually two of my kids went with us and they talked to representatives in Albany about homeschool matters. And um, we got to know our local um, representative, Stacey Ekramada. Um, and she recognizes me on the street now. She's like, you're that homeschool lady. Um, just because we went to Albany and we visited her office and we sat there and we talked to her and she got to speak to my intelligent kids. Um, so I think where you can, you have this opportunity as a homeschooler to touch things where, you know, they may not be able to bring an entire class into Stacey Fepromato's office, but I could bring my entire class into Stacey Fepromato's office. And she was so happy to meet with her constituents. So that is definitely, I mean, and even if, I think they do it on Zoom a lot now because of pandemic times, but that won't always be the case. And, you know, that was Albany. But where else can you touch because you're actually a very small unit, you know, in the city doing things. Um, firehouses, you can go in. They, they like to see people. They want the public to know what's going on there. Um, and, you know, things along those lines. Where else can I touch the world as a homeschooler? So just some ideas. So can we use BQ Leah as a support group? Well, I, I want to say, oh, my word, yes. <laughs> this is what we do. We are a support group. Um, if you look us up on our um, website, you can find the join now button, um, join us button. I think it says join us, not join now. Um, and we generally have monthly meetings where our families get together. Um, I met both of these lovely ladies in Brooklyn, Queens. Leah. Actually, Shawan, I met her before at um, one of our outside um, things at NYU Children's Place. I think that's where I met you. Um, where they have a great chorus and that they, they do it online. So if you, you know, considering you have a songstress or a singer or a whistler, NYU Children's Chorus might be a place where you want to like plug in. <laughs> they have great whistlers there. I don't know why. Um, it's part of the musical thing. So um, yeah, we're definitely a support group. Um, one of the things we do is this homeschool workshop. Um, we also, um, like I said, have monthly meetings with different themes. Um, we've given our kids opportunities to hone their public speaking through different events that we've done. We've done science days with dissections for the older kids and science experiments for our younger ones. We've had art days where everybody made a clock made out of a record. Um, we've got, you know, all kind of different um, athletics with our coach Danny and a lot of the programs that like bowling and swimming and ice skating that were at, external to what coach Danny does. Um, and what else do we have? I could probably talk about it for a very long time. Mom's night out, dad's night out, um, uh, 
we have a graduation at the end of the year for all of our graduates from four different groups of um, kids. Uh, we also have a picnic at the beginning and the end of the year and various other things like field trips. I think we're doing apple picking this year. So yes, we are a support group, but we're one of quite a few in the city. And when I say find your tribe, think about if this is like a fit for you. It was definitely a fit for me. And I ended up being here for something like eight, nine years, something like that. Um, and expect to be here for until the end of you know, our homeschool career. Um, but definitely, yes, we are. So you can check us out on WordPress, um, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Are we on Twitter? We actually have a group of our um, teens that take care of some of our social media. It's our social media um, club and um, they create our um, content for Instagram. So if you check out our Instagram, that's our babies being awesome. Um, and if you check out our website, that's Tina being awesome. <laughs> And Tina has put our um, info in the chat. I think I think that was it. I actually have to get going. Um, did we have anything else we needed to um, focus on, do you think, before we get out of here? No, I, that was it. Unless, um, as a matter of fact, I think we all have to go because um, we are. We, it is going on an hour and a half. We allocated two hours, um, but I know all of us have a thing to do at 2.30. So um, I want to thank everyone for coming here. You have both of our, our contacts on there. So those are the easiest ways to get one of us. Um, if you are messaging us on our Facebook page, that is either myself or Jackie that is answering that. Uh, if you send us a, any information through our contact on our WordPress page, then again, that's either Jackie or myself answering those questions. So um, by all means, I hope we got all, the, I, actually, I know we got all the questions. I hope this was helpful for you. Again, if you want the, the full Homeschool 101 workshop we did, that is on our Facebook page as well as our website. And if there were any questions that maybe we didn't get to or, or you have or you need more clarification on, by all means, send us a message on our Facebook page. That's probably the fastest one that you'll get an answer through. And um, yeah, I, I think we're good. I want to thank our awesome chapter leader, Jackie, and our steering committee member, Shalon. Um, it is always a pleasure doing these things with you guys. I love working with you all. Again, like I said, I'm in New Jersey now and I miss y'all, but I miss them so much that I decided to renew my membership for another year. So I don't know how I'm going to work it out, but we're going to work something out. But again, um, thank you everybody for coming. We had more attendees than what we originally thought. So we're glad that you are with us. This is being recorded. So you will probably see it either on our website or the Facebook page within the next day or two, just give us a chance to go through it and make sure everything is clear. And um, yeah, thank you for joining us. It was a pleasure answering questions and we can't wait to see you guys again. Talk to you soon.